Okay, hello everyone. Um, I would like to thank um, Deborah and Jeff and the Fountaindale Public Library um, for allowing us to continue with the genealogy day, but in segments. Um, so everybody has some type of genealogy to do um, since we can't go anywhere because a lot of stuff is closed due to the coronavirus. Um, like Deborah said, um, the program today is Browse and Break Down Walls using Family Search Catalog like a pro. Um, in Perfect. Images and photos are courtesy of Family Search, just so everybody knows that all of these came from the Family Search website. What is the catalog itself? The catalog is a guide to help you find birth, marriage, and death records, census records, church registers, books, periodicals, family histories, videos, audios, CD-ROMs, and many other records that contain genealogical information. These records may be searchable online, on microfiche or microfilm, in a book or a computer file itself. When you search your catalog, you will find numerous things. You will find records, records themselves, you'll find images of records, so pictures of records that people have taken, letters, either personal letters from family members or letters from World War I, World War II, the Civil War, so letters pertaining to the military, you will also find those um, spread out through Family Search itself. You will also find videos, audios, photos, and many other things um, when you're looking when you're looking through the catalog itself. Okay, when you go in, for some of you who may be new to Family Search, or some of you that are not, um, years ago when Family First Family Search started, you could just go in, search search the catalog, and do the searching, but you couldn't access the records until um, you create an account. Well, in the last few years, excuse me, they've made it so you have to create a free account before you can do anything. Okay. Um, signing up for a free account is ra rather simple. Um, and I will show I will show you where to go on the screen itself. But you would click on create an account, add your first name, last name, your date of birth, and then after that, then it will ask you for an email address, and then you'll need to search, uh, hit, hit, um, hit a button, and then the button will take you to where you add what you want your username and your password to be. So, um, and then once that's all done, then all of that is submitted to, the fa to family search themselves. And, that, and they will have to respond back to you to say that your account has been established before you can actually access it. That time period is anywhere from five minutes at, at the minimum to about 15 minutes normally. At this point, some people are seeing 20 to 25 minutes because of the number of people on the site now. So they're just asking for people's patience and understanding they will get the accounts established as quickly and as humanly possible. So just be patient. It's well worth having to wait for. Um, if you already have an account, you will just sign in. Um, depending on the browser that you're also using, if you've signed in and you've asked to stay logged in, you will have a menu option in the upper right hand corner to actually be able to do some searching from there. But again, that is based on the browser that you use. Um, Google Chrome does not have that option, um, but some of the other browsers out there on the market do. Okay, this is what the screen will look like when you go on to family, after you type in familysearch.org, just to point out a couple things for the newcomers. Um, you have your menu options here, so you have your family tree, you have your search, you have your memories, you have your indexes, and then you have your activities. And then over here, you have your help menu, you have your sign in, and you have your create account option in the upper right hand corner. Um, if you're new to family search and you have not created an account, 
You can click here to create an account or up here to create an account. If you already have an account, you can click in sign in here or you can do where the big blue arrow is in the upper right hand corner. Okay, this is what the sign in screen will actually look like. Um, it's very pleasant, easy to look at. Um, it's not crowded. So basically what you would do is you would type in your username here. You type in your password. <coughs> this is where you have the option of signing in for two weeks. I don't recommend that, especially if you're using a public computer, because other people would be able to access your computer as access your account as well. I don't even recommend that on a personal machine, especially if it accidentally gets hacked. Um, you don't want people getting into your account and adding and deleting things to it. So I don't highly recommend that at all. Also, if Family Search updates anything, it will not update until you sign out and sign back in again. Um, and then down here is your sign in button. You also have your option down here to create a free account. And on the very bottom of your screen, you'll see sign in with a church account. That's for people that are members of Latter-day Saints. They have their own special login because they can access things everybody else can't. So there's certain things on Family Search that you can only access through uh, if you're a member of the church itself. Okay, after you've signed in, this is the screen that it's gonna look like. Um, and the first thing you wanna do is you wanna click on the search menu because that's where the actual catalog is. Um, so you click on the search button. Okay, and then this is just um, a, couple, a little information there. Okay, you have your drop down menu here, and these are what's available in your drop down menu. The third from the bottom is the catalog. That's where we're going to focus on today. That's, that's our baby right there. So we click on catalog, um, and then that will take you to the search screen. When you search in search the catalog, you will need to first choose what you're going to look for because Family Search has so much information out there that if you type in something so generic that you're going to get 230 to maybe 300,000 um, different records to look at. And that's just a lot for people to, to take in. So if you can narrow your search down to what you're actually looking for, then you'll be able to narrow your searches down to maybe anywhere from, you know, seven records to maybe 200, which is a lot easier to deal with than 250, 250,000 to 300,000. So you want to do that. And then you'll be able to decide the database or the sub, the area you want to actually search in, in the catalog itself. Okay, this is what the search screen actually looks like. These are the these are the first six search topics, and then there's two down below here. So we will be touching base on all of these so people have an idea of what's available and what they can actually search with. Okay, the first thing we're actually the first thing we're gonna search is by place, so by location. So we go back to the family search um, screen. Because place is the automatic default for family search, the place feature will automatically be selected. So if it's not, you want to click on the word place. Okay. Then you want to start typing in the place that you're looking for. So I typed in Chester. As you can see, when I typed in Chester, I got all of these options for you to look at. So what they will always do is they will always go with the country of origin first. So right now, because we're based in the United States, they will go with the United States first. If we were based in the UK, they would do the UK items first and so forth. Then what it does is it will look, <coughs> excuse me, for any of the states that have the, have the word Chester in it. So you can see you've got some options here. We have New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Utah, Vermont, Virginia, Washington, West Virginia, and then there's more options to go. Okay, 
what I'm looking for is for Pennsylvania. So United States, Pennsylvania, they only have one record, I mean, one listing, Delaware, which is the county in which Chester is now located, and then Chester. So I'll click on this entry right here. Okay, and then this is a list of other additional places you can look for Chester County. So we've got all of these different options here. We have biography, we have business records and commerce, we have cemeteries, we have centennial celebrations, we have church histories, church records, directories, genealogy, history, history colonial period, school yearbooks, schools, and vital records. Okay, so those are all the areas that you can look for Chester. And then what it will also do is tell you how many entries each of these areas have. So we have as little as one item for the biography, one for yearbook, one for history, colonial period, and vital records. But the two highest areas are church records because of, because of the Quakers, and then the directories. Pennsylvania is very high on Quakers, so church records will be extensive for Pennsylvania because that's where a lot of the Quakers originally settled. So I'm gonna choose church records. What'll happen is this screen, it will, it'll be a drop-down screen for you. So these are the drop-down options. There's 10 of them, but you only see seven of them on the screen. As you can see, a lot of it is uh, Presbyterian records, Methodist, Episcopal, uh, um, church records, um, and then you have the one down here that's St. Paul Church, which maybe is an Episcopal church. So these are the different um, records that you can actually take a look at. The one thing I did want to mention is on the right-hand side of most of the screens you will see this morning, you will have the add feature. What the add feature gives you the capability of doing is adding this, adding this record to a list and then when you're finished doing all your searching, you can click on where it says print list. You'll see print list throughout um, things going on with Family Search, And you can actually print a list of everything that you looked at. And then that way um, you can go back in later to search these if, if you want to, or if you, when we are able to go out, um, go to a family history library, a family affiliate like Fountaindale is, or to go to just another library or historical society or anything and be able to look some of these things up if you're in, if you're in the particular state this information is in. Um, so these are the different items. Oops. Um, and then you would just click on it and what will happen is it will bring up a list. Uh, it'll bring up a title page for you to look at, which will give you the title information. And then if it is available online, it will give you that option. And I've got quite a few options um, throughout the presentation of showing you where you can get a digital copy. Um, but I always suggest to people when they're doing searching is to do any. But in this time period, because we can't get out, um, I usually suggest online. Um, for most of the searching, but you will see when we go, when I go through the presentation, there'll be a few times where I will say any because of what you're actually looking for. So, okay. The next thing is the search by surname. Um, that's when you want to look up somebody's name, a family name to see what records are out there for that particular surname. Now you will have some surnames that will have a lot of information on it, like Smith and James and Thomas and Taylor, you know, and then you'll have a few of them like um, maybe Fuller, um, Droga Mueller, uh, Mueller, um, where there may not be as many depending on the nationality um, that's there. Um, or some of the Japanese names may not appear as often. Um, you will find a lot of English, Scottish, um, some German, not all German because my mother's family is entirely German and a lot of their names do not appear in, in family search that often. They do appear one or twice, once or twice, but not all the time. So, um, but that, this is where you'll actually do the searching for the surname itself. 
So we're back to the search screen again. This screen will become your friend when you're searching because you will be going back to it multiple times. <laughs> Excuse me. So you want to click on surname when you get in there because again, place will automatically be selected. So you click on surname. Then this box will come down here for you to type in your surname. So you go ahead and type in your surname. Okay, and then down here um, for availability, for the surname, I would start with doing the any screen um, because this way you can see what's out there and then we can always go back and limit it later. So as you can see, I typed in the word ensign because that's one of the names in my family tree that I'd want to look up. So I typed in ensign. I chose any. Okay. Now, after I did that and I hit the search screen, I came up with 70 records for Ensign, okay? Which isn't too bad, but if you have, if you don't have the time to sit and scroll down 70 records because you have, they only show you the first 20. So you have about maybe three and a half pages to go through before you actually, or two, um, two pages, three, pa two, between, between two or three pages to actually find what you're looking for. So if for some reason you're, you can't sit there and scroll through all that, on the left-hand side of the screen, you will have your refine search option where you can refine your search by many different ways, by different categories, by availability, or by language itself. I'm looking right now at the availability option and right now there's 37 of these items that I'm looking at that are available online. So I want to click on the word online because I want to actually see the online versions that are available. So this is a list of 37 of the um, records that you can see. I scrolled down because I was looking for um, so for my Ensign family. And these next, this book and th this item right here, Ensign Family Data and Ensigns in America are both related to my family. So I'm going to first click on Ensign Family Data, Connecticut. And then this is the, re this is the title record page for Family Search. It gives you the title. It gives you the format. Is it a book? Is it a CD-ROM? Is it um, a microfilm, um, that type of thing? Is it a photograph? All, that will all appear in the format screen. Then it will give you the language, okay? It will tell you if it's in English, German, Latin, uh, Italian, what uh, Japanese, it'll tell you all that. And then it will tell you the physical description, meaning the pages, okay? How many pages are there in this thing? I don't consider this so much of a book as I consider it a pamphlet because it's only six pages. So, but if you look down under notes, you will see view a digital version of this item. Click. So we click on here. And this is actually the front cover of the pamphlet I was talking about. So this is actually a picture or a scanned image of the item, okay? So you'll be able to see that. It gives you the title, <coughs> excuse me. It gives you the title number. Um, and what the title number is, it's the number in which FamilySearch gives the item when they process it and put it into their system. Then you have the language, you have the subjects. So this book, this pamphlet covers the Ensign family, the Elson family, and the Gunn family. It tells you at six pages who the owning institution is. So this is Sacramento, California Family Search Library. It was published through the international system, and it's got public access, meaning anybody can actually look at it. With Family Search, there will be some things that you're not going to be able to access from home, so you have to go into either the Family History Center or the affiliate, Family Search affiliate library to look at, or there will be some where only the Mormons are allowed to look at it. So it all, it all, it all depends. Um, but if you scroll down, 
from the first screen I showed you, you have view all pages. So you can view all six pages of the item that you're looking at. So you can click on page six, click on all pages, and what it does is it will, it will give you, you'll do, be downloading the entire book or pamphlet, which you can actually look at. So you can thumb through it and um, see what items are actually available, um, what's in there. You can also share, you can also share what you have to a family member or to a friend or to an associate that you think might be interested to somebody. So um, you can do that. The next thing is searching by title. Now, place, keyword, and subject, which we will cover in a little bit, um, are the more common ones. The next two I'm going to be talking about are not as common because a lot of people, when they go in to do searching through family search, do not have titles of items that they're actually looking for. But what I find with the title search is I can also just type in you know a word and then it will do search it as the word being the it part of the title of what you're looking at so um <coughs> so that's another way of um doing that excuse me i just have to take a drink of water okay okay so we're back to our search screen again and we're going to click on titles because we want to do a search, uh, um, search through title. So we click on title. Okay. And then we will type in a title if we know it, or just a word or two that we think might be in a title. And then we want to click online. So I have just a little words here of what I actually did. So if you didn't hear me, this is what I did is I type the title of a book, a database, an item. Um, I made sure I clicked availability and then I click on the search button. Okay, and I typed in this time Ensigns in America um, because that was one of the items listed when we did the search previous. Then I clicked on online because I want to be able to see what's available online. And then I hit the search button right here. Okay. This is what the results are. Okay, we have four results. So what it did is when it did the search itself, it was looking for end signs. It was looking for America. Um, so these are the results that came up from doing that search right there. And these are the ones that are available online. The one in the middle right here is the one I was actually looking for. End signs in America with allied families, record of the descendants of James Ensign, the wife, Sarah Ensign, it was done in 1634, 1939, and then again in 1960. So this item has been revised three different times throughout the time the book's been around. They've made changes. Okay, this is the title page, title screen again, giving you the information it used to catalog this item. This was compiled and published by Martha Eunice Ensign Nelson. She is actually also the author of the item. The format is books, monographs, book on digital images, meaning this book has been digitized. It's in English. Um, it was uh, the digital version was published with Family Search International in 2013 in Utah. This is all it, it, you have a reference here, and it says record of the descendants of James Ensign and his wife Sarah Elson, 1634 to 1939. So what this means is the Ensigns in America is a revision of this particular book itself. So this book itself, Records of the Descendants of James Ensign, was originally done in 1634. They revised it under the same name in 1939. And then when they revised it in 1960, they changed the name to Ensigns in America. Also, you will notice that when you do searches in the catalog, there may be notes in the note field. So you want to actually take a look in your note in the notes to see if there's anything. This one tells you that there's a digital version of the item available. Okay, so we want to click here 
and that will take you to a stamp the type um, an image <coughs> of the book or item and then the title information again so you have the title number that they used creator language all the names the family names that are listed the page numbers now when this book was originally issued back in 1634 and also in 1939 we were not at 890 pages okay it the first book was maybe about 30 to 40 pages and then when the next revision came up it may have been like about a hundred to maybe 200 pages the newer version is like about this thick um, to look at um, but they're just giving you a sample of what the inside cover looks like because it is just a revision that was just renamed but the front part of it is still from the original image now again if you scroll down you do have the option here to view all 890 pages so again you click on this what this does is it takes you to the um, archives the um, internet library and then you can um, down, you can actually download it and again you have the option of sharing if you would like to these are the names that are in it again the page number this was actually donated to the family search library so this was actually a donation and again it's got full public access so anybody can actually look at it okay the next thing is search by author this is the one that is the very very unused um, because a lot of people do not know the author when they're actually looking um, I just happen to when I do some searching I do have some names um uh, some authors to use because some books have been done on branches of my family so i do have some author names but a lot of people don't um but i do need to show this feature to you because this uh, this feature is is here is available and i don't want to not include it in the presentation okay so we're back to the search screen again so we click on the word author so the author's name comes up here okay <coughs> going to click on author we're going to type in gilbert cope um gilbert cope is an author um that's not with us anymore but he did quite a few books um and then we're going to choose online availability okay so i typed in gilbert cope again i want online editions um, so I can do stuff from home. So then I click on the search button down here. Okay, now with the authors, different from the titles, keywords, and subjects, is it will only list, if there's only one entry for the author, it will only show one entry. So in this case, there's only one entry for Gilbert Cope. He was born in 1840, died in 1928. There is 89 records for him. So there's 20, 89 things that his name is attached to in this system. So we want to click on Gilbert Cope. Okay. This is only four of the 89 um, items that he's attached to that are on the screen. So you have um, the sentence of George and Jane Chandler. You have monthly meetings, you have abstracts of records and births, you have abstracts of the wearing monthly meeting in York County, Pennsylvania. So what you do is you just keep scrolling down and scrolling down until you find something. So I found genealogy of the Sharpless family, descended from John and Jane Sharpless, settlers near Chester, Pennsylvania, 1682, together with some account of English ancestry of the family, including the results of searches by Henry Fishwick and the late Joseph Lamel, Lamel Chester, and a full record of the bicentennial reunion that was done in 1882. This family had an enormous um, reunion, and there is talk about possibly trying to put one again, another one together because there's even more descendants now. So that I think that would be fun to do if they're able to get it going. Okay. It tells you the statement of responsibility, which is basically the author. So this was actually compiled by Gilbert Cope. These are the authors that were attached to it. It gives you books, monographs, and book on film, which is microfilm. 
So this record itself here is a micro, microfilm um, record. So I wanted to show you what one of those look like. It gives you the language, the publication, so Washington, D.C. in 1968. It's one microfilm reel. And then it gives you the reference. It's the record of Sh the Sharpless family um, by Joseph Sharpless, 1772 to 1849. So this is what a microfilm reel record will actually look like um, when you bring something up. Now this is going back to um, the, um, the results from when I did Gilbert Cope. Okay, this was the microfilm one that we just looked at. Down here is the actual book itself. Um, so I'm going to click on the book. Here's the microfilm again. Okay, then we then we click on where it says genealogy. Sharpless family descended from John and Jane Sharpless, settlers near Chester, Pennsylvania, a 1682. So we click on that. Okay, this is the actual record itself it gives you the information again this one was done actually in 2014 so this was just digitized about six years ago um, so um, that's so that's not that's not too old and then down below here under the notes you will see that there is a digital version available I also want to mention if you look down below there's a few more notes this was actually done by the Bicentennial Committee in 1887. Uh, it's got 1,333 pages. It's in two parts. It also includes illustrations, the coat of arm, facsimiles, genealogy tables, maps, and ports. So there's a lot of information in this book. Um, this was the very first book done um, for the family. Um, there is a new version out that's three volumes done by another person who I believe is related to the family. So right now it's not in the family history library because a lot of the people in there are still alive and a lot of the family would prefer that the books do not end up on family search until uh, most of the family on that in those books are deceased. Um, so, so we're going to go ahead and click on the digital version. Okay, this is the inside cover of the book. The books um, are leather bound, so it's very hard for them to scan the front page, the front cover, even though some have um, done the front cover. Um, but Family Search didn't want to waste their time, so they did the inside cover. So this is the title number that they gave. These are the authors. These are some of the names that are listed in the book. So we, if we scroll down, down here, which is the underneath the um, picture itself, you will be able to view the entire book and share it as well with others like we did before. Okay, this is one of the inside pages. And this was one of the revisions that was done by Henry Fishwick. So this is the history. Uh, um, the family started out as Sharples and then by the late 1800s, they added an S to it and made it Sharpless. And that's what it is known to, of as today. Um, but this talks about the, the hamlet of Sharples in, in England and then just gives some family history. And then it gets right into the genealogy aspect itself. Okay, next is a subject search. Now this is one of the two areas that people use a lot because they're looking for particular subjects in genealogy, like probate records, church records, birth records, marriage, death records, land records, um, will records, um, you name it, that's what they're looking for. So they would automatically gravitate to the subject search or the keyword search to be able to um, actually do what they're looking for. So a subject search, it's always a good idea uh, when using family search is to also do a place search when you are doing a subject because if you just do a subject it's going to cover the entire 50 states plus the UK plus China plus Italy plus Germany France whatever it's going to look everything um, internationally so if you nick so if you limit it to a place search as well as a <coughs> A subject search it'll help you narrow your searches down quite a bit so I'm going to do Connecticut as my place and then I'm going to do probate 
as an, ex as an example. Okay, so we click on where it says subject right here. Then I'm going to type in the I'm going to type in Connecticut, and what happens is again United States pops up in Connecticut. Then I'm going to do the probate. So I'm going to put in probate under the subjects, and then I'm going to click online, and then I'm going to hit the search screen. Okay, these are the seven listings for Connecticut. So we have archives and libraries, inventories, registers and catalogs, probate records themselves, probate records, bibliography, probate records, indexes, probate records, inventories, registers, catalogs, public records, and taxation. Um, again, each of them has the number of records listed under each of them. We're going to just do probate records in general because I want to see the probate records themselves. So I click on that. This is what will come up. Uh, this is a list of the five records listed under probate records. So we have the digest of early Connecticut probate records, miscellaneous and abs miscellaneous notes, abstracts, wills from the New England states, probate, estate files from 1881 and 1915, probate files collection early to 1880, public records for the colony of Connecticut, and so forth. Okay, so we're gonna choose digest of early Connecticut public records. Okay, again, this is the title, um, title pay, the title screen off of their website. Um, this is the information they typed in. It was compiled by Charles William Wing, Wan, Manwaring. He's the actually author of it too. It's a book monograph, it's been digitized. This book was originally published in Hartford, Connecticut. This one is a three volume set. So this is very extensive. It will also give you a call number, which I will talk about later. And then it references other editions of the books that have already been done. And then down below here under the notes, it will show you volume one, volume two. You can't see it because I couldn't get it on the screen without making it smaller. Um, volume three does appear. So I'm going to go ahead and click where it says here. Okay. And then this is more title information for this particular volume. Um, also it tells you it is a three volume set. The thing encompasses 700 pages. So this is extensive. This is the inside front cover of the book. So this is volume one. This is the Hartford district. Hartford happens to be um, one of the biggest um, cities in um, Connecticut. It's also the county seat. I also believe it's also the capital. I could be wrong on that. Um, I have to remember my, uh, my history and geography. But um, this is the first volume. If you scroll down again down here, you will be able to open it and download a copy of it for yourself and you'll be able to look through each of the volumes and find the information you're looking for or actually share it with a family member. Okay, the next one is keyword search, and this is the most common one out there on the market. Uh, most people are going in to do keyword searches because they want to do a combination of different searches to be able to find what they're actually looking for. Some people are looking for specific probate records on somebody, a fam, specific family member, or they're looking for birth records for Cook County, Illinois, or they're looking for corner, corner records for the city of Chicago, or um, the, the, um, the records of um, so the Civil War for the um, Confederates in Virginia or something like that. They're looking for something really specific and the keyword search gives them that capability of um, doing specific, combining several words together and be able to do a search um, to do that. So um, basically with the keyword search, I'm gonna start out with books first because that's an extensive and then I'm gonna narrow it down to Chester County, Pennsylvania. I just want to show you what happens if you don't use 
if you don't try, narrow your search down. So I'm going to choose keywords so it'll open up the keyword screen. So it opens the keywords. I'm going to type in books. I'm going to type, I'm going to click online because I want only online access right now. And I'm going to click on the search button. Okay. After I typed in books, look at the number of results we got. 234,852. How many of you are going to search through all of those records? I don't think so. <laughs> that is, that is, is extensive, and that's a lot to have to go through. So what I would suggest is go over to your refined search and type something else in. So after the word books, I asked, added Chester County, Pennsylvania. So I wanted to see what I could get for on books on Chester County, Pennsylvania, because Chester County is one of the earliest counties in Pennsylvania. Um, it was originally Upland when it was originally founded and, and that type of thing. And then I'm going to click update because I want to update. I want to keep books, but I want to add Chester County, Pennsylvania. So you want to click update. And then it will give you a list of everything that came up after that. I went ahead and scrolled down because I was looking for something specific and I found a biographical and portrait cyclopedia of Chester County, Pennsylvania, comprising a historical sketch of the county done, done by Samuel T. Wiley. So this is, this, I found this book very interesting and I wanted to actually take a look at it. So I click on that. Okay, this is the title catalog record that they used to catalog it. This is the information. Um, this is the person that was responsible for the item. He's also the author. Um, format is books, monographs, book on film. So this is microfilm. And then it gives you where it was published and what it is. It's actually one microfilm reel. Uh, um, so this item is only, well, normally it would be only available in microfilm. But what Family Search has been doing is they, since they're not sending out microfilm anymore or microfiche, they are actually starting to digitize their entire collection. Now this is going to take decades for them to go through because they've got so much out there. Um, but they are gradually um, scanning and digitizing the materials to put them up on the website. And this is one of this is an example of one that they've already done. So. Um, so it is available digitally. If you look from the original, it had it has um, appendices, then it has uh, up to 879 pages. 48 of those pages are plates and ports. So there's a lot there's a lot of information in here. It also tells you it's available as a digital image. So you want to click where it says click here. This is the actual front cover of the microfilm or the book. Um, this is the title number. So this is one of the earlier ones that was put into the system. Um, it tells you it's microfilm, how many pages. So it's about 900 pages with the plates and the illustrations and everything. Um, but right here, you can click to see all 900 pages or again, you can share it with a family member or a friend if you want to. Okay, this is one of the inside covers of the book just to show you what one actually looks like. So this is a sample right here of the front page. Um, so um, I, I downloaded, I haven't taken a look at it yet, but um, I found it very interesting because like I said, I've got a lot of family. My grandma, my dad's mother's family is originally from Chester County, Pennsylvania. So um, I'm very interested to go in there and find out the history of the county. Okay, the last two that I'm going to cover with you are call number and microfilm searches. These two are not very commonly used. I don't know how often they are used um, because these are also a little more difficult unless you know a call number or you know a um, microfilm number. But these are part of the catalog, so I felt that I needed to at least cover these. Okay, so we're back to the family search catalog again. We want to click where it says call number because we actually want to do a call number search. So we click on call number. Okay, 
Then it will bring down the call number box. You type in a call number. So I just chose 920 out of the blue. Um, libraries, most of the gene, a lot of the genealogy collections in the public libraries will be under the 920 call number. If you go to a college or something that's under the Library of Congress um, shelving system, it will be under a different number. Some other places have recataloged and changed it to different numbers and stuff, call numbers. But I just chose 920 because I thought that would, one would be more common for people um, that would be more familiar. Now, what I also do with call numbers is I choose any because I want to see what is actually out there. If I choose just online, then it's going to really limit me on what's available with that call number. So I choose any, and then I choose the search option, which is right here. Then this gives you the results we got. So we have 588 results for the call number 920. Now you can scroll down here and um, like I said, there's only 20 on a screen, so out of 588, there's going to be quite a few pages to go through. But you would just scroll through and see if you find anything. If you do look, under, you have the title, you have the author, and then you have the call number itself. So, um, so it, gives you the, it gives you the three digits in front, and then after the decimal place, it will give you the last three, or in these cases, these are other designations um, for, cat for cataloging purposes. But you would just click on one of these and you would get the title record like you would before for any of the other searches that would give you the information. And if it's available online, it will tell you if it's available online, um, but, um, that's basically what you would get for that one. Okay, fiche and microfilm. Now, the fiche and microfilm search is only good for people that are looking for microfiche or microfilm that are available in the Family History Library. So if you don't know a fiche or a microfilm number, this would be very um, a little difficult for somebody to use. Um, but I will show you how to search it. Um, you can also, I, I will also show you something else just so you can go about doing your searching here. So we, so we go to the family search screen. We click on film or fiche. So it clicks right there. Then we type in the fiche number. Now, when I show you on the next um, slide, one of the fiche numbers I wrote, all down all of the fiche number are, are numeral so and most of the microfilm numbers are anywhere from six to seven numbers so you could go in and just type 101 and see if you get anything or type in another you know another number and see if you get anything um and then that way i mean it's a little cumbersome you know being able to do it because you don't know what you're going to get but you know, that way you can at least see what a microfilm option looks like. So we type in the fiche number. So I typed in 6011428, which is actually a fiche number itself. Then with fiche, you have to choose any because most, uh, most of it is going to be only available in a family history center or a family affiliate because some of those may have um, microfilm from Utah. Um, like I said, previous, some of, they are starting to digitize, but you don't know what's been digitized, what has not been digitized. So it's better that you just choose any, and then that way you don't have a problem finding something. So then after I type all of that in, I click search. Okay, this is the only one, that, this is the thing that came up for this particular call number. So it's Boston Transcript Genealogy Newspaper Columns, June 6, 1896 to April 30th, 1941. And the author is Carlos Parsons Darling is the author. So we actually click on this. Okay, this is the actual title, rec the cataloging title record. So it gives you the title, 
It gives you also what it's known as. So it's known as the Boston Evening Transcript is what it's actually called. Um, it's a manuscript, manuscript on fish. So this is what you'll get if it's on fish. Yeah, it's on fish. If it's on microfilm, film will be, fish will be replaced by film. And then it will give you the language. How many reels? So this one has got 682 fish sheets. Okay, and fish are just like um, a camera um, negative but like um, in an index card format is what it looks like, but it's, it's like a negative. And so there's 682 of those. Well, if you look at the time period it's covering, to me 682 seems small compared to the time period that they're looking at, you know, but that's what they said it is. Um, down below here you have your notes, collection of genealogical inquiries, Answers clipped from the Boston Evening Transcript, clippings from 1896 containing general inquiries and notes. Collection contains also a few personal papers of Carlos Parsons, darling. So that gives you an idea of what's actually on the fish. What it will say is no circulation from family history centers. A few years ago, they stopped sending film and fish out to anybody. So whatever the family history libraries and the affiliates have is what they're going to have. They're not going to get anymore. But that's why family search is in the process of scanning and getting the microfilm digitized so they can put it on the website because they know people are upset that they can't get film anymore or fish. Okay, this is scrolling down the title screen just to see what else is available. You have your locality subjects, so it covers United States, New England genealogy, United States, Massachusetts, Suffolk, Boston newspapers, United States, Massachusetts, Suffolk, Suffolk, Boston genealogy. And these are all of the microfilm fish listings. And like I said, this goes on 682 times. If you look down here under the film, the first one ends with a one, the next one ends in two and so forth. So the first six numbers remain the same in the beginning, and then it's just the last number that changes, and then when you get to 10, then it's the last two that change. But if you also look down, look on the very right-hand side, the format, it will show you a reel that looks like a microfilm. Or if it's a book, it would, say, it would show you what looks like a book that type of thing. So that's what you're going to see. Okay, um, I did want to mention a couple other things. Um, when you're also doing searching, make sure that um, if you even know a year in which you're looking for, it doesn't hurt to put a year in because that way you can narrow your search down a little bit. Also, um, if you're looking at um, you also, when you go through, you may also see CD-ROM records. So when we were looking at before under Connecticut records, um, I, we had one that said early records of Hartford, Connecticut. Um, there was land records. You click on land records, and it will give you early records of Hartford, Connecticut, land records 1639 to 1688, vital records, probate records. This was actually available on CD-ROM. And so the record itself will say CD-ROM on it. So you'll see, and this one has actually been um, digitized. Some of it's been digitized as well. So you'll be able to look at that as well. Um, my contact information is up on the screen. So if anybody has any additional questions after this presentation, please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, I do suggest that you contact me via email. Um, you will get a quicker response from me. Um, the phone number, I get a lot of telemarketers and stuff. So if I don't recognize the phone number, I usually let it go to voicemail. Um, but if you email me, I check my email two, three times a day. So if you email me, I will respond with usually within a few hours, if not 24 hours out. But that's the longest I will um, not respond. Um, so that's my answer. Okay. All right, fantastic. Yeah, thank you, Jen.
Um, right. And thank you all so much uh, for attending. I do have a couple questions and a couple things, items to share. So uh, Dan, uh, he uh, sent a couple items in the question answer, just to remind everybody the availability of surnames uh, in family search is based on what has been indexed by the LDS or what's yes. been available in a family tree. So, yes. um, so some of that is, so that's what yeah. majority of family searches microfilm collection has now been digitized and is online but the remaining microfilms are being scanned right now and they're probably going to have that done by 2021 <laughs> so thanks to dan for sending yeah. those out it was really lovely of him to send those in there's so much to cover in this yeah. topic so thanks dan for sending those uh, are there any other questions uh, that questions? Any other questions? Oh goodness, I'm not hearing anything. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, because I'm not seeing any other additional questions. But Dan did send a link. Uh, Uh, microfilms so that's going to be great so that's another good thing that I'm sure that will I'll add that thank you Dan I'll add that to the link that's we'll put in the recording for this session so if there's no other in, in the chat okay someone said it in the chat what is the best way to handle names like O'Brien okay O'Brien um because they're spelling it well, they, well, I mean, it's, well, it depends on, it depends on the spelling, because um, O'Brien is spelled, could be spelled a couple different ways. Um, the standard O'Brien, um, not the standard, but I mean, what co is common is O apostrophe B-R-I-E-N, I believe. Um, I would put, I would put in the apostrophe between the O and the B first. Usually that will work to do the search. Um, if it doesn't leave the apostrophe off, but usually um, now they've recognized that there is an apostrophe between the O and the B. Um, Cause I know I, ha I've ha I have several family names that have apostrophe in there too. And I've had to, um, I've had to search, I tried searching it with an apostrophe, it didn't work, tried without it, it did work, but then now it's working with the apostrophe. Also the different variations, um, I would, I mean, I would search the different spellings um, because it depends on the record and who put the record in, um, because some people may have spelled it how they remember it being spelled and it may not have been spelled the way you're thinking it's going to be spelled. So I would, I would also search the different spellings just to see if you can find anything that way as well. All right, and that was a question from Lynn. So thanks Lynn for sending that to us. Um, if anybody does have any other questions, you can send them into the question and answer area at the bottom of your screen. And if not, I wanted to let you all know that the two sessions that we have for next strategies with Tina Baird at 11 a.m. And we're back with us on the 24th. Deborah, are you were actually picking up there. If you, repeat, if you could repeat those oh. going back to Tina's presentation. Yeah, so Tina's presentation is on Wednesday, the 22nd. So that session is going to be on searching family search. So search strategies for family search. Registration for that is open right now. I've just put a link to that in Facebook. And on the 24th, Jennifer will be coming back to have her session on joining the Mayflower Society. Registration for that is open as well. So if we're literally looking for the next sessions, and we have some great programs lined up for you in May. So as there's no other questions, thank you so much, Jen, for your time today. We really appreciate you spending the morning with us. We really love having you with us. Well, thank you for having me. All right. And th thank you to everybody.